TLO, what's pop? We are on kick, K I C K dot com. We are not live, but you can leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK. This is the highlight channel, you know, the lit one live, man. If you miss any of the the uh, lives, this or any of the shorts and things of that nature will be. Um, we also got the Patreon. We watch Patreon five days a week. I ain't going to click it because it's on a screen that I don't want to be on. Uh, but yeah, check it out. Don't forget we do got merch. I was rocking my white shirt today. It's looking clean. <laughs> Uh, anyway, man, you can check out this. All this is in the description of this video. Under link tree, click it. Everything will pop up. This is disturbing. Disturbing is low key an elite channel for disturbing videos. Uh, of course, RIP to everybody involved that has unalived or been unalived in these videos. But this is a murderer. Too dangerous to be released. The case of Jesse Bloggett. Blodgett. Sounds American. And this case takes place in the United States of America on the 15th of July, 2013. Jesse Blodgett was born on the 22nd of March, 1991 in Cobb County, Georgia. Though her family later moved to Hartford, Wisconsin, where she spent her formative Wisconsin. You gotta remember, Wisconsin right above Chicago. It's something that we don't know about Wisconsin as, as Chicagoers. We normally stay up out of there, unless it's to do with things of that nature that I do not promote on this channel. Other than that, I went to Wisconsin like two times and I was like... I'm ready to go. <laughs> I, don't, I don't like the vibes. <laughs> of years growing up. From a very young age, Jessie displayed a deep love for music and the performing arts. Her parents recognized her talents early on and wholeheartedly supported her creative pursuits. She immersed herself in music, learning to play various instruments and developing a remarkable singing voice. Throughout her childhood, Jessie's dedication to her passions remained. She continued to hone her musical talents and eagerly participated in school performances okay. and local events. As she ended her teenage years, Jessie's artistic pursuits flourished even further, and she engaged in community theatre. She eventually graduated from Hartford Union High School in 2012 and accepted a Distinguished Talent Scholarship from the School of Music Education of the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Outside of school, she took up a job mentoring disadvantaged students. And Good for her. She was a pillar of hope. <laughs> a pillar of hope. You know what I'm saying? She had big dreams and aspirations. Of course, this is how these videos always start. They get us to fall in love with the victim, which she's a, she's a great person. She volunteered to give students should. voice, piano, and violin lessons. When Jessie finished her freshman year in college, she came back to Hartford to live with her parents for the summer. Hartford is in Connecticut. It's something about Connecticut we don't know either. I just, I stay in Chicago and Florida. I would never live in any other city, probably. Any other two cities. I'm good. On the 15th of July, 2013, Jessie's mother, Joy, stepped into her daughter's room. She peeked into Jess's room just before she left for work that morning and found her peacefully sleeping. Jessie had attended a party the night before and was likely just tired. But later on in the day, Joy stopped home for lunch. She shouted for Jessie, but there was no reply. Confused and a little frustrated, she entered Jessie's bedroom. And upon entering, she was met with a sight that no mother should have to see. She found Jessie unresponsive in her bed. She wasn't breathing, was blue, and cold to the touch. Jessie's mother quickly called the emergency services. But, but, but just those description, that's that light description that he just did, it's too late. Blue and cold to the touch? 
and frantically told them the situation and how she had found her daughter in such a condition. But Joy said something to the operator that showed that this wasn't a natural or accidental death, but rather something far more sinister. She said to the operator, Her pants are all wet, and she's got what looks like strangulation marks. Jesse's father Buck would also come home to the horrific scene. Law enforcement and medical responders swiftly arrived at the residence following an alert from the dispatcher. Joy had attempted to As a parent, like on some real stuff, like like I don't know, I'd be destroyed if I came home to something like that. That is crazy. Form CPR on Jesse, but tragically it was too late. When the paramedics arrived, they confirmed that Jesse was dead. Detective Richard Thickens of Hartford Police was confronted with the tragic scene as he entered the home, discovering the lifeless body of 19-year-old Jessie lying on the floor. Her neck bore strangulation marks, and there were faint marks on her wrists hinting at possible restraint. Restraining. The grim evidence left no room for doubt. This was now a crime scene under investigation. Jessie's hair and clothes were damp. This unsettling detail painted a sinister picture, as it suggested that the perpetrator had staged Jessie's body, likely washing her up and placing her back in the bed, in what seemed like an attempt to erase any DNA evidence. It also became clear that the killer possessed an intimate familiarity with the house, as no signs of forced entry were found. You see what I be talk like I don't know if y'all all watch these. If you new to the channel, appreciate you. If you were, if you were valued long time member, salute. But this is like these is like like this is a weirdo that did this. This is shocking. Like you like the mental process, the the the, the steps you are taking. found. The focus turned to the party that Jesse had attended the night before. One attendee, an older man, came under scrutiny due to his behaviour at the party. A journal entry penned by Jesse herself hinted at an uncomfortable encounter with him. The man who had crossed boundaries by pulling her onto his lap in a non-consensual way. Inve Don't keep yourself in the dark like this guy. then found that this man had skipped work on the day of the murder, but despite this, he was eventually cleared as a suspect. Unbeknownst to the investigators working on the case, what was his alibi? case of Jesse, a parallel investigation was underway in a neighbouring town. A woman by the name of Melissa had been attacked just days before Jesse's murder. Melissa was walking her dog at a local park when she was attacked by a man with a knife. After a brief struggle with the unidentified man, Melissa managed to take the knife from him before he ran. Thankfully, she was able to remember every detail the older man or, uh... of her traumatic encounter. Her vivid description of the attacker and his van led to a crucial lead. When Melissa began describing the van, an officer recalled seeing that very same van parked suspiciously at that very same location where the attack had occurred some weeks before. The officer had run the license plates through the system and was able to look back on the system to find the license plate number, which led them to find the owner of the vehicle. The owner of the vehicle did not match great police work officer match the description of the attacker, but they found that their 20 year old son did. His name was Daniel Bartelt. Officers went to the home that the car was registered to and spoke with them. They asked if they could speak with their son Daniel, but the parents informed the detectives that he was attending the vigil of one of his friends who had recently been murdered, Jesse. Detectives then asked for Daniel's phone number and his parents obliged. So he then went back and he murdered her this is where I think it's going to. He unalived her and went to her visual. Visual? That's what it's called. They left the home and made a call to Daniel. Daniel answered the phone. Detectives asked if they could speak with him at the station, 
and Daniel agreed to meet them. Daniel, who was still at the vigil, said bye to Jess's parents and made his way over to the station. So when detectives sat down to talk to Daniel about Melissa's attack, they asked him what he had been up to. Daniel replied and said that he had been at Jess's house for a vigil. The detectives then asked Daniel what had happened to Jesse. His response was both shocking and incriminating. Daniel said that Jesse had been essayed and murdered. This was incredibly significant because at the time, not even the police knew that Jesse had been essayed. essayed. During the interview, detectives told on himself. Detectives noticed injuries on Daniel's elbow and hand. Daniel claimed that he hurt himself at work but detectives knew that he no longer had a job, which prompted Daniel to change his story. I hope they, they was in Hartford, Connecticut. I don't know what they laws is like, but the, just, the, just the whole setup. He need life, no no chance of parole, and he, he almost need the, the DP, D-E-A-T-H penalty. Like just the way he going about it, like is, like is, it's deserving in my opinion. He then told them that he hurt himself while cooking. Realizing that Daniel was obviously lying, detectives began to ramp up the pressure. It didn't take long for Daniel to crack and admit his involvement in Melissa's attack. When asked why he had done such a thing, he replied, I just wanted to scare someone. Melissa was then asked to pick Daniel out in a lineup. She instantly recognized Daniel and pointed right at him. Daniel was then charged with the attack on Melissa. Officers then began Let's to not forget Jesse now. question whether or not he could be responsible for the murder of Jesse too. Daniel's computer was searched. There was a search on spree killers, serial killers, and snuff films. Like why? Like what triggers somebody that want to be this and then go search it up how to do it? Like their predecessors, the greats, like what, like, what do you, what, what do you, it's weird. Daniel had downloaded a number of snuff films, one of which matched the events that unfolded in Jess's room. I ain't never even heard of a snuff film until two weeks ago. I'm a grown man, never heard of it. <laughs> For what? In the snuff film, after strangling the woman, she is washed and placed back into her bed just like Jesse was. The pieces of the puzzle are lined, revealing a disturbing portrait of a- Hey Siri. Nope, not even gonna do it. <laughs> I just thought about it, nope, nope. Don't even want that searched on my stuff. Young man consumed with dark fantasies. Daniel was now a suspect. Somebody in the comments let me know exactly what that is because I've, I've seen it in a, like, a video like last week or two weeks ago, but I still don't know exactly what it is, and I'm I don't know. Act in the murder of. I, never mind. Don't even explain it. I don't even want to know. Jesse, during the police interrogation, Daniel pretended to cry and claimed that he had nothing to do with Jesse's murder. They then discovered that Daniel was writing a story in which a girl named Jessica is murdered. When asked about his whereabouts, Daniel claimed that he was at a park on the- So what, he was writing his own story? He was writing a serial killer book, and he was the main character, and he was really doing it? The day of the murder, investigators then looked at the CCTV, and sure enough, Daniel was there. Jesse's family spoke with the investigators and told them that they didn't believe that Daniel was responsible. They couldn't believe that he would be bold enough to kill their daughter and attend her vigil and cry and share memories of Jesse with the family and friends. That portion right there that he just described is the reason I think that he, did, he deserves the D-E-A-T-H penalty. That alone, like what's going on in your mind? That means you would do this again with no problem. But they were wrong. The police went to this park and the trash cans were searched. Investigators discovered a box filled with ropes that had been used in the crime, bloody sanitizing wipes and tape. 
Forensics found Jesse's and Daniel's DNA on the rope. They also found the exact tape under Jesse's bed. More evidence then came to light. During the struggle, Jesse did attempt to fight back and she scratched her attacker. Dan mm, his DNA was under her nails. Daniel's DNA was found under Jesse's fingernails as she had scratched him during the fight. Jesse and Daniel did have a history. They briefly dated in high school and- Oh my God. Crazy ex, so now he's the crazy ex. Were close friends. Daniel too- Did See now, okay, go back, go back, let me- They briefly dated in high school and were close friends. Briefly dated in high school and now are close friends. If it didn't work in a relationship, it ain't gonna work as friends. Let it go. Because this is what happens. In my opinion. Am I cool? Am I fr Can I honestly say I'm friends with any of my exes? No. Are we cool? Are they cool with me? Yeah, because I ain't do nothing wrong. It was their fault. <laughs> At the end of the day. I'm a good guy. But anyway, come on. Let's finish the story. History. They briefly dated in high school and were close friends. Daniel too had a passion for music and acting. The two had spent time together before the murder had occurred. It then came to light that weeks before the murder had taken place, Daniel had tried to force a kiss upon Jesse and she had rejected his advances. See? It seemed from the evidence he was sticking around trying to be friends in hopes that he could rekindle the relationship. Like, go on, bro. She is done. Don't be friends. It's only confusing somebody. Somebody's getting confused in this situation. That Daniel had made his way over to Jesse's. It seemed from the evidence that Daniel had made his way over to Jesse's house knowing she would be home alone. He gained entry and attacked her. He then hogtied, gagged, and essayed her before strangling her to death. Daniel then washed his DNA off her body, hence why she was wet, and put her back into her bed. Daniel was charged with a- That also. D-E-A-T-H penalty. Murder of Jesse, and the trial would soon begin. It looks like strangulation marks. There are strangulation marks? That's what it looks like. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's going on. Joy Blodgett wipes tears from her face while listening to the 911 call she made after finding her daughter unresponsive in her bedroom on July 15, 2013. I lifted her body down to the floor and I put a pillow under her head and then I just started doing compression. Daniel's defense tried to claim that all of the... For future reference, when you're doing CPR, never put a pillow under the head. Got to take that chin down or up so the airways are free. A pillow would restrict that. I'm certified CPR. Evidence that had been put forward was merely circumstantial and did not prove anything. Daniel too tried to proclaim his innocence, but had no evidence or proof to suggest that he was not responsible for the crime. Despite this rather impressive defense, it wouldn't take long for the court to find the truth. Daniel was found guilty of the murder of Jesse and was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. There you go. I'm telling you, see, it's different than the USA. Oh, you're going forever. Like you're never getting out. <laughs> Fitting. It's life in prison with no parole for the Richfield man convicted of killing a former classmate. A judge sentenced Daniel Bartlett, Bartelt late this afternoon for the murder of 19-year-old Jesse Blodgett. Blodgett was discovered strangled in her bedroom in Hartford. WISN 12 News Nick... Hartford? Where is that at? That's not in Connecticut, is it? West Bend? I don't know where that is. Bohr was inside the West Bend courtroom when the sentence was handed down. Daniel Bartelt was the reason everyone was here in court, but the young woman he killed, 19-year-old Jesse Blodgett of Hartford, was the person on everyone's mind. You charmed us, you challenged us, you dazzled us and inspired us. So confident and free to be yourself. So encouraging of others to do the same. Even as Bartelt was sentenced to life without the chance for parole, he claimed he's innocent. Blodgett's family said bluntly they don't believe him. I 
have a disgustingly innate ability to lie to myself that I have exercised far too many times in my life. But I refuse to hurt someone other than myself by doing that. When Dan murdered Jesse, he killed not just who she was, but who she would become. She will never have the chance to be that woman. Who myself by doing that. I refuse. Bro is lying to the skin. Look how many times he just blinked. In my life. But I refuse. Your eyes ain't that dry. That's a lie. To hurt someone other than myself by doing that. When Dan murdered Jesse, he killed not just who she was, but who she would become. She will never have the chance to be that woman. And I will never have the chance to know and love and admire and take pride in that woman. Bartelt still faces three other charges accused of attacking a woman in a park a few days before killing Blodgett. That's what I'm talking about, the serial. As he was sentenced to life in prison, a chilling absence of remorse hung in the air. The family of Jesse found no solace in his words, and the conviction marked the end of a relent. But if you claim it, so he's claiming not guilty. He's still after conviction claiming not guilty, which leads me to believe he's going to go and um, get a retrial or whatever it's called. What's it called? Where they redo the case? That thing. He's going to get that thing. Um, and to show remorse is to show guilt. Uh, essentially so he can't if he plans to go try to get a get do it again like a mistrial or not a mistrial but redo the trial endless pursuit of justice today daniel remains imprisoned good. serving a sentence without the possibility of parole good, 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 good. it is clear that he is far too dangerous to ever be released if he were to ever be released it's likely that he would strike again this was Agreed. the start of Daniel's murderous career. It's likely that he would have committed far more murders if he was smart enough to evade justice. So, why did Daniel do this? Well, the authorities could not prove a concrete motive for the crime in court. However, the prosecution firmly believe that Daniel killed his friend because she had been a convenient target. And he carried out the twisted crime for his own sinister enjoyment convenient target and he had hurt her feelings she had hurt his feelings with that denial denying him the kiss just tell her leave a like comment subscribe turn on your post notifications i'm gone let me know what y'all think